we're going to read from Psalm 136. And what I would like for us to do is in response to the Word of God, I would like for us to, I would read the white print, and if you'll read the yellow print, and you will take note of the amount of times, 26 to be exact, in which you will say, His steadfast love endures forever. His steadfast love endures forever. Psalm 136, the reading of God's Word. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods, for His steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, for His steadfast love endures forever. To Him alone does great wonders, for His steadfast love endures forever. To Him who by understanding made the heavens. To Him who spread out the earth above the waters. To him who made the great lights, the sun to rule over the sky in the day, the moon and the stars to rule over the night, to him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt and brought Israel out from among them. With a strong hand and an outstretched arm. To him who divided the Red Sea in two. And made Israel pass through the midst of it. But overthrew Pharaoh and his host in the Red Sea. To him who led his people through the wilderness. To him who struck down great kings and killed mighty kings. Sihon, the king of the Amorites, and Og, king of Bashan, and gave their land as a heritage, a heritage, a heritage to Israel, his servant. It is he who remembered us in our low estate and rescued us from our foes. He who gives food to all flesh gives thanks to the God of heaven for his steadfast love endures forever. May God bless the reading of his word. Lord God, we come before you this morning with gratefulness in our heart as we are commanded to do to give you thanks we enter your courts with praise and with thanksgiving we gather as your people who in these last days have been reminded in such an acute way of just how fragile we are and how big you are Lord we're reminded of while we are so small you are a great God and there is no one like you you're the God above all gods. You're the Lord of lords and the King of kings. And there's no one really who can compare to you. And so we worship you this morning because you are the one true and living God. And as your word so profoundly proclaims that the God of all the generations is the God who is with us, that you are for us, that you are in our midst, that you are Emmanuel with us. And we thank you for this. We praise your name this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. This week has been what I think many of us have, and many of you have, the children. Okay, we need the children. I thought, boy, my heart sank right there. Somebody's flagging me down in the middle of the service. Let the children go. That's what Moses said to Pharaoh. <laughs> Woo! It's post-traumatic syndrome for me. What's going on here? Right over there. I'm going with you. Somebody take over this service. Woo, that scared me. I mean, that's the way we've been, haven't we? Something comes up and we're just like that. And... Some of you men and women have worked in the plant 
the plants in our area for a long time, and you can testify. In fact, some of you, you retired after decades. You retired from the plants, and it's very much a part of the culture. It's a part of how we make a living here, how you provide for your families, and how you take care of your loved ones. And it's been a tremendous resource for our area and for the country, for that matter. I was surprised to find out just how few people even knew what was going out outside of Mid-County. It's amazing. Go to North Texas and, I mean, unless you tell somebody, they don't even know. Your own family doesn't even really understand what you've just gone through. And as many hurricanes as we've gone through together and experienced and other disasters, nothing like this at least in the years that I've been here. And so it just causes us to pause, doesn't it? I knew that when we came home uh, a little earlier than what we had planned, we came home late Friday night, and like you, I evacuated. I obeyed my own exhortation to evacuate and to be in compliance with those who are in authority over us for our own safety. And uh, we evacuated to North Texas, and we spent Thanksgiving with our sons and our family there, and we were very grateful to do so. But we were ready to come back home. This is our home. We've been here 24 years, as I was sharing with someone before the service. We've lived here longer. I've lived here longer than I've lived anywhere in my life now. This is my home. This is our home. We wanted to get back. Not that anything was going to be any different, but we did notice driving in, and even yesterday as we ventured to Beaumont, fearfully so, because it's the shopping weekend of the year, right? To go to Beaumont and to exit at Dallin. <laughs> I just wanted something to eat, <clears throat> and that turned into other enterprises. But we, so we, we, went, we exited there, and I noticed so few cars. And Cheryl had posted something online, and it was getting quite a bit of attention, and we were having lunch talking about, why are people commenting on this? And, and, it's, and it's the middle of the day. I mean, people are not normally on social media, and Facebook particularly, on uh, Facebook in the middle of the day. And it just dawned on us that, you know what happened? Y- you were probably like so many other people. You came back to your home, and you know what you wanted to do? You wanted to just sit down in your home. It was still there. And I don't, certainly don't want to create some kind of sensation here, but we were grateful to sit down in our homes and to say, Lord, <clears throat> it's still here. And to give the Lord the credit. I hope you did that. I think many people are wanting just to sit in their recliner or, you know, just sit down and just take a deep breath and try to take in the moment and understand that, you know, try to process what was going on and what this week had been like. So in a few moments, I hope to give a few of you a chance to share some testimony about, I told you last night I was going to do this, and we might just have somebody who's not in the service today that you might want to give me their phone number. I'll call them in the middle of the service and say, you're not here, but we want to know, the church wants to know what you're thankful for, because I told them we would do that. Rusty, there you are, okay? So (laughs) Rusty, you know, he posed a question on our Facebook Live last night. Potentially, he might not be here. Well, I know he works sometimes, like some of you, on Sunday. And so I thought, well, we might just call you. Never know. But we were thankful, and we sat down, and we began to process this and think through and say, Lord, we are very grateful. And I was brought to Psalm 136. And the, the impressive thing about Psalm 136, the impressive nature, if you look at the structure, the beautiful um, psalm that we have to worship by and the psalmist records for us the the character of God the creative stroke and power and majesty of God all founded upon his character these are the four key ideas I want to give you and then you can go back and read them but there's there's this beautiful outline that he lays out for us that the creation emerges from this wonderful God who is good That's the fundamental premise of who God is. Give thanks to the Lord because He is good. There's a lot of question about the goodness of God, especially when people are going through difficult times. But we can see the goodness of God in so many ways. The psalmist is saying, look at the goodness of God as He has created all things, as He has conducted himself in these wondrous ways, these marvelous ways in which God has conducted himself by 
bringing his people out of 400 years of Egyptian bondage. This is, he's going to recount the story of Israel, okay? And he recounts the story of Israel, recounting step by step these significant events in Israel's history and the life of God's people of old to remind them that God is not simply a God of past generations, but he is a God very present in this generation. That's where he's taking the psalm, okay? So he brought them out of this land of 400 years of bondage, and he brings them into a new land. He defeats one king, Pharaoh, and then he takes them into a new land, the land of Canaan, and defeats many kings. And we don't have time to really tease that out and really examine it extensively. But know that while God has overthrown these kings in the land that he promises for his people, it does not diminish the goodness of God. He's good. He's wonderfully so, creating and liberating and redeeming. This is what he does. And these are the marks of God in the psalm and throughout the Old Testament. Creating and liberating and redeeming. This is what God has done. So he says, give thanks to the Lord. Give thanks. So I'm just going to put somebody in the hot seat right off the bat. And so I... I Jeremy Walker, right now, you're just going to come right up to this microphone. You didn't know what I was going to do. We'll, we'll, we'll get some microphones ready, but come to this microphone. This is a guy who works at the plant, works at Motiva, one of our plants. He's head of the union out there. And uh, what's on your heart? Well, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thankful for the hot seat. <laughs> no, I, we were fortunate. We were, we were uh, out of town. And uh, I guess about 2 in the morning, my phone started going off, started getting calls, not calls, but texts and messages. And so I set up and started looking at it. And Sarah woke up too, and we started to see what went on. And, uh, you know, just you live in this area or really anywhere along the Gulf Coast, and your life in some ways is impacted by this industry. The oil refineries, chemical plants, either you work at them, you know people that do, or you service, you teach their children, you know, you work in the hospitals and care for the people that are sick, and, 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 and in some ways, everything in this community is, is hinged on this industry, and uh, it's been that way for 100 years now, and it'll be that way a long time, and I saw, scrolling through a minute ago, somebody put, I'm thankful that we don't have a spirit of fear. And, you know, fear can grip a community. Just like we learned in our lesson this morning, Zacharias, you know, immediately became fearful of something that, that God told him, do not be afraid. And so we see on Facebook, we saw in the media, a lot of fear this week. And, and, and rightfully so, because there's things that happen that occurred that create fear and, and have the power to do that. And, and it's okay to be aware, but... As Christians, we don't have to live in that fear and walk in that fear. And we don't have that, that spirit of fear among us. And so one thing I did see in the community this week and on Facebook and, and in conversation was that we can overcome fear and that God provides a way. Just like in Psalm 136, he provided a way for his people through the wilderness. He provided a way when they were in Egypt, a way out. And if you've worked in, in this industry, no doubt you've encountered things that uh, were pretty significant events. One of the things we do when we train new employees, and it's kind of comical, but there's a point behind it, is we tell them, you're not making ice cream out here. Respect what you're dealing with. And, and it, at some point, anybody that's worked in this industry for any time has seen an event where, and I don't know how to describe it, but something happens and there's a way out. There, there's, there's, if you want to say it's God providing it, and I would say that, there's a, there's a path out. In this event that happened, it, it's so soon, you know, they haven't even investigated it yet. Who knows exactly uh, what happened? We will know that at some point, no doubt. And there's stories that are going to come out. Some of you might already have heard some where God protected people, provided a way. Thankfully, there was... How in the world there was not more injuries? It's only, you can only account God providing and protecting. There was an event earlier this summer, I won't ramble on long, but there was an event on the East Coast in Philadelphia where there was a refinery that had a significant event, very similar. And due to the very quick trained responses of the people involved, 
it was mitigated to a point where there were no injuries and no significant uh, injuries in that where if it would have went a different direction you could have had acid gas pour across the city of Philadelphia and affect millions of people and that didn't happen because of the people that were trained and the provisions that were there in place and in this event you know I think about you know what happened and, and no doubt we're going to hear stories of 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 this occurred and this occurred and this occurred that prevented mass casualties and prevented mass you know destruction beyond you know more than what did happen uh, God provides a way and as Christians we can look at that just like we saw in our lesson this morning there is fear that happens but God provides a way and he just simply puts that spirit within us as believers you don't be afraid just like he told Zacharias don't be afraid you know I have got all things in my control Amen. and so we can live with that and we can share that and as a spirit of fear can grip a community believers can step in and share a spirit of peace and I think that's what our role is in this amen thank you thank you Jeremy and as someone how many of you work out at the plant or one of the plants where you raise your hand you worked out there or you do right now how many of you now go ahead and stand up will you if you worked out there or you work there right now would you go ahead and stand up okay it's a lot of folks right there or you have you how many of you have loved ones that work out there okay Okay, go ahead and stand with, with your loved ones. And, and uh, okay, look how many of us are affected. All right, it's a lot of people. It's a lot of people. Father, you are good. And nothing that happened this week changes that. In fact, in many ways, it reinforces it that you have cared for us. You have taken care of these families and many more. The first responders that moved quickly lord we take for granted so oftentimes and we ask lord your blessing upon them and your protection you gave that lord you would not have been you would not be less had there been loss of life we know that but we do thank you that there was not loss of life we do thank you that all of these families who were here last week are here again this week we thank you for that we give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. When the psalmist says, give, give thanks, why give thanks? Because God is good. What is it about the goodness of God? I'm really honed in on this idea of the goodness of the Lord, His character, because from God's character emerges everything else. Creation, how He conducts Himself, and ultimately, how he fulfills his covenant with his people, and he cares for his people. But he's good. The Hebrew word is the word tob. It means that he is best. He is better than. One translation, it's in few places, but it does occur. He is beautiful. There's your three B's right there, okay? It's right out of a biblical dictionary. This one, you know, I didn't make this up. He is, he is best. He is better. He is beautiful. That, that is, there's nothing within his character that can be distorted. There's, there's nothing in him that has been distorted. He's always acting consistently within himself. There's never a moment in which God errs. And that he's flawed. We never see anything that God does or that who he is that's flawed, that has something missing. This is like a beautiful portrait. There's, there's nothing in it that one, once you've examined it extensively that you look at and say, but there's this little right up here if you notice that. There's nothing like that about God. He's beautiful. He's complete. He's whole. And so when the psalmist says that we are to give thanks to the God who is best and better and beautiful, and it is an imperative, he's saying you, in essence, you will want to give thanks to the God who is best and better and beautiful because you have this intimate knowledge and personal experience with him. This is what the word means, to give thanks to the Lord. You will do so because you have personal, intimate knowledge, experience. 
This is not cognitive. It's not exclusively cognitive. It's more than something intellectual. Certainly, it's something we need to understand and comprehend. But I want I want us to drill down on this for a moment because it's saying to us that because we know, yes, we know, but we know that He is this, that this is His character. We will give thanks to Him. In in other words, it's saying that. We who give thanks to him do so because we have intimate and personal knowledge of him. Thus, the conclusion is, is that if you do not give thanks to him, it's because you do not have personal and intimate knowledge of him. Are you with me on this? So if you're long on the face and short on words and expression to a great God about how good and great he is, how best and better and beautiful is if you can't come up with something to say this to the Lord and express this in the kinds of ways that our affections were 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 given to us to to actually express God by there's something's wrong something's wrong now we don't all express ourselves in the same way that's not we're not looking for uniformity but we are looking for the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace that we the body of Christ that's why it was so important for us to be here this morning I'm preaching. Keep scrolling some of these statements up by God's people. Do we have a microphone here? There's someone, Cap Hawyer's going to say something right here. Go on right over here. Charles, right over here. Go, right, move, move quickly because it's on, this is on. Cap, I'm putting you on the hot seat, brother, but I know you know the goodness of the Lord. Huh? There you go. (laughs) Well, that tells you how experienced I am with doing this. I did work in the chemical plant industry for 30 years, from 74 to 04. Uh, I'm very grateful for that. A great living. I worked for a great company called DuPont. Uh, I was in operations. 28 years of that was shift work. Spent many, many nights, Thanksgivings, Christmases at the plant uh, because that was part of my responsibility. You know, I've always had that sense of danger within me. Uh, Companies are there to make money and they make changes which we as human beings think are wrong when they reduce the number of employees. And it just gives you that sense of danger that sooner or later you're going to go too far and there won't be enough humans involved. It'll be more uh, electric and more automatic and safety devices. About 20 of those 28 years, I was part of the emergency response team, anywhere from a firefighter when I started to an incident commander before I left. All the way from uh, right there on the front lines, all the way to the back, making the big decisions of when to evacuate, how to evacuate if something should happen. And we trained, and we trained, and we trained. And they still do that today. And I truly believe only by the grace of God that these companies have continued to train and train and train, not cutting back where they need that desperately. You know, I made the decision myself, even though it was mandatory, I went against what Brother Joe said. <laughs> but my Let's wife and, uh, came in there and said, Let's go. She has a cousin that's a lawyer, and the lawyer had called the family, called Miss Sarah, and said, Y'all need to get out of there. It's bad. It could be bad. So Shally told me, Let's go. So I got in the car with Shally. We picked Mama up. And I got to the end of the driveway, and I'd said a few little silent prayers prior to that. Uh, a number of reasons why. (laughs) 
But we got to the end of the driveway, and I told him, I said, I, I don't think I need to leave. I, I think I need to stay. And I say that not because I'm so great or so wonderful and all that, but it was the 20 some odd years of training I'd had at the chemical plant to know what decisions are based on and how far you're going to spread out. You're always going to err on the safe side. I'm 2.7 miles from the site. And I knew that prior to that going to the end of the driveway. And so they did. And my mother, that's my angel on earth. If anybody believes a human can be an angel, my mother-in-law, Sarah Lawrence, is an <laughs> angel. She is my angel. Uh, she did not say, no, you got to go. She, she stayed quiet. And I felt like that was my sign that it's okay. If Sarah would have told me, we got to get out of here and you're coming, I would have went with them. Needless to say, I stayed, and, and it was all because of my previous training, wind direction, humidity, type of chemical, uh, safety measures. I'm just truly grateful. Like I say, this is not Amen. my cup of tea. I can't stand up in front of people. Uh, if I was to tell you my life story, you'd probably run me out of here and take the <laughs> microphone away. <laughs> but I'm truly grateful. Uh, Amen. Truly grateful. We're grateful. Grateful to you, brother. Thank you. Amen. And you earn some points listening to your mother-in-law as opposed to listening to me. I get that. I'm with you on that, right? Look at the last part of Psalm 136. Take some time. His steadfast love endures forever. We have, we have four English words to describe what two Hebrew words are given for us as a basis of this translation. Th that, that steadfast love, over and over, that's how it's translated, sometimes mercy. Steadfast love, that, that, it, endures, that it endures forever. The Hebrew word that exists there is the word olam. It means time out of mind. That is, I want you to think, the psalmist is saying, comprehend, try to comprehend this, that God's steadfast, abiding, continuous love, his loyal love, directed toward you as, my, as covenant people, that that will abide forever and ever and ever and ever. It, it's, it endures forever. When time is out when time is out of mind, when your mind ceases to actually be on a process, you know what 10 years looks like, right? Some of us can feel what 10 years. If you're a teenager, you're thinking, no, I don't know. <laughs> but as you get a little older, 10 years, okay, you might, you could probably comprehend 25 years. Some of you may be 50 years, 75 years. 100 years, that's, Real, real fuzzy here. Real fuzzy for me. A hundred years. Some of y'all can probably get there at a hundred. But what about 500 years? What about a thousand years? What about 3,000 years? See, it's time out of mind. As far as we're concerned, that's time. That's, that's time out of our mind. That is, I'm out of my mind. That is eternity. That's my inability to really take this in. So as far as I can think, as far as I can comprehend and I can consider with this little mind of mine, which I cannot comprehend eternity, eternity exists beyond the place in which I can consider. Going forward and in the past, it's a lot of time, folks, right? What he's saying is, that's the steadfast love of the Lord. When you can't think about it any longer, it still exists. That's it. And then look what he says in verse 23. It is he who remembered us. It, it, the word remember means that he marked us. 
that he's mindful of us. I am so grateful that this past week that the Lord was mindful of us. He was mindful of me. This past year, we had someone with Jews for Jesus, and he came and taught us Christ in the Passover. It was a great, a great uh, teaching and um, a great experience that we had together. But one of the things that he actually wrote was um, a series of articles on mindfulness in Hebrew studies in the Hebrew scriptures. And anyways, not to get too technical, but we talked about this. And, and the, the point of his articles and the point of, 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 of that subject matter is to talk about how mindful we should be. It is the Christian response to a mighty God to be mindful of him. And it takes us gathering our thoughts and disciplining our thoughts in such a way that we become very attuned and focused on him. Yet there are times in our lives, many times, when we are not mindful of him at all. I mean, we are not thinking about him at all. And the grace of God, which is what it is in so much depth, is that it intervenes in our life, it intercepts us, it stands right in front of us, the Lord does, and by, by his grace, his presence, and he intercepts us to, to bring us to an understanding of who he is, rather elementary as it may be, but it certainly centers around who is Jesus, what he came to do in his death, his burial, his resurrection. And we are somehow brought into this understanding of who this Lord is, God is and we believe he was mindful of us even when we were not mindful of him he did not forget me he remembered us that's important to to you widow women and widowers who are sitting alone in a holiday season Maybe without any family or anyone sitting with you, you're sitting there and the house is quiet and it seems like everybody is mindful about a thousand other things. But let me tell you, there is a God who is above and he is mindful of you. To that single mother who's wondering how she's gonna make it this next week. To that plant worker who's saying, you know, I don't know that I'm gonna have a job after this. To that person who's going through some trial in your life right now and it seems like though nobody really knows what's going on and yet you, you feel all alone in your circumstance. He is mindful of you. He's mindful of you. There's never a moment in which God has a moment of being what we call absent-minded. There's never a moment in which God says, oh, I'm sorry, Joe. You know, I, I, knew, I knew we were supposed to get together. I'm sorry. I, I, he never has to apologize because he's mindful. I just love this. And from a deep place, the psalmist talks about this worship of the Lord. So let me try to land this, okay, because there's, there's so much. Will you read Psalm 136? I'm so full of thanksgiving this morning for my family, for my friends, for my church, for the safety of the multitude of men and women of this past week. Pray for Guy Burnham, and he's in Houston right now with other engineers. He works, recently was hired at TPC after many years at another plant. It's part of our church family, isn't he? So many people we know. God's mindful for such a time as this. He has us where we need to be. And together we needed to come in here as the church and we needed to sing and we need to give thanks and we needed to breathe together and we needed just to be together, didn't we? Didn't we? And just to take a, a deep breath and just say, I'm here. Some of you have said that. I'm just thankful, truly. And you're not just saying it. You know, sometimes we say that. Yeah, I'm just glad to be six feet above. You know how we say these little things that we say? No, truly, you're saying, I am grateful. I'm very grateful. He remembers me in verse 23. Let me give you three R's, okay? <laughs> three R's. You know a preacher had to come up with 
something alliterated, but it's right in the scripture. Verse 23, it is he who remembered us in our low estate. What is he saying? He's saying he's not just the God of prior generations. He's the God of this generation. Faithful to the past, he will be faithful to the, to the future and to what he has promised to his people. That's what he's saying. Verse 24, and he rescued us from our foes. He redeemed us. That's what the word rescue means. He delivered us. And literally the word means that when he rescued us from our foes, it, sometimes it's translated, he, I know this is going to be an interesting term, that he broke us off. We were, we were broken people, but he, he broke us away and broke us off from whatever pieces that were left of us, God has made something of us. He made something of me. He made something of you. That's what he does in redemption and rescuing us. So there's the second R, right? His steadfast love endures forever. He who gives food to all flesh for his steadfast love endures forever. And he sustains us. He renews us and replenishes us. Give thanks to the God of heaven for his steadfast love endures forever. Let's stand together. Let's say this together. Can you repeat it after me? For his steadfast love endures forever. For his steadfast love endures forever. For his steadfast love endures forever. Amen? Amen. 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 Praise be to God. Lord God, we thank you for this day. And we worship you. There is no one like you. There's nothing that can be spoken, really, ultimately, that does justice to your great name. And yet, we've been given the wonderful joy, the privilege of giving thanks to you and expressing that in ways that words and emotions and with our heart and our soul and our strength and our mind and every ounce of our affections that we are told to yield to you so that we will honor you. We thank you for that, that you have called us, that you have rescued us, that you broke us off and then you took the pieces and you redeemed us. You redeemed us and we praise you for all of it. Lord, we, we, we will spend forever contemplating your steadfast love toward us. And, and Lord, when this life comes to an end, you will still be God. And nothing will have changed. And all that you've ever done and all that you've ever promised will come to pass and will be fulfilled. We thank you for it all in Jesus' name.